Well, I suppose it's that time of year again where I should be making my gardening report. It's not going very well this year. I just can't figure out what's going wrong. Last year, same problem. We had these big, beautiful squash plants, and uh, they had these gorgeous flowers. I thought, boy, we're going to have we're going to have so much zucchini. We're not going to know what to do this year. But not a single one of them came to fruition. And I decided this year that I would take this new, wonderful, magical soil that I was sold on by the gardening center, the best in the world, they made it themselves, and plant it in my box garden. And it may be this year, something different would happen with the squash plants. But once again, beautiful flowers, no squash. And what's worse than that, more than squash, I care a lot about tomatoes. I've got five tomato plants this year. I planted them in a brand new garden. That maple tree that had to be cut down because it died, the, 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 the surprise for me for that was now I've got more sun. So I moved the box where there's more sun, put in brand new soil, and said this year I'm going to have no mealy tomatoes. They're going to be excellent. I've already had to replace two of them. <laughs> and not only that, I'm finding that, well, they're not looking very good. They haven't been very green. I looked today, they were improving, but they're not growing much. Only one of them's growing and already a critter's gotten in and bit on the plant. It's probably going to die. It's not a good year for tomatoes. I keep thinking maybe I just need to become a master shopper of the produce section in a grocery store. <laughs> It would be a lot easier if I could pull that off. But you never know. And you know what really upsets me, though? There are years that this has happened. I bet it's happened to some of you. You know, you've put out that pumpkin over, over Halloween, and you, you smashed it, or someone smashed it, and some of the seeds got in. And next thing you know, the next year, you've got a pumpkin plant. And you've got a pumpkin for next Halloween or for, or for a pie. I've had it happen with watermelons. Watermelons we've disposed of to fertile the garden with the old part of the wood. And there's watermelon plants. I didn't do anything. I didn't have to toil it or clear out the weeds. I didn't have to water it. I got a watermelon. Now, how is that? Why are things turning out that way? Well, today we have a scripture where you'll see where I'm going with this. You probably can uh, surmise that. Uh, you can tell that the truth is that this morning scripture is a simile which, uh, that Jesus taught to give us an idea of what the kingdom, the kingdom is something you, you can't just put into words and this is exactly the nature of the kingdom, what it looks like and it feels like. You get at it by parables and similes. And this is one of Jesus' great similes. He says the kingdom of God is, it's like, it's like a sower who goes out and sows seeds everywhere. And somehow, those seeds go down deep into the soil, and the next thing you know, they sprouted, and then there's a stem, and then there's a head, and then there's the fruit that comes from that. And then all you got to do, what? Go pick the fruit. That sounds more like the pumpkin and the watermelon than it does my tomato plants. My tomato plants, I go out and water, I clear out the weeds, I do the soil, and it's just not an easy thing. You know, I don't understand what Jesus is getting at here until I realized I'd rather have an automatic garden. You know, one that just kind of does itself. You plant the seeds and the rest happens. And I think that's something about what Jesus is saying to us. We get very anxious about things. We plant, we do something and we worry and we worry, and we stew over it. We expect the worst. We make plans for what happens if things go wrong. And, um, but in this garden of the kingdom, when you sow the seeds, you don't have to worry about it so much. Because it's not all up to us, it's up to God. And God makes them grow. There is the word, I didn't realize this this week, the ancient Greek word uh, for earth or for soil is a rather magical word. The word is, the ancient Greeks apparently understood that 
the scripture in our text here means automatic because the word ground meant automatic. So when Greek people, ancient Greek people, looked at the earth, they saw that seeds were sprouted, and automatically you've got things growing out of it. You don't have to do anything. It just happens on its own. It's automatic. I love that. I love the idea of something automatic. How many of you drive a manual shift? Anyone can drive a manual shift here? This crowd better than most. Kira has to raise her hand. She had no choice. We've got two manuals. And she's had to learn on manual. She's doing quite well with that. Now it's a breeze from here on out, sweetheart. But I got to tell you, owning an automatic is nice, right? Because you don't have to worry about the manual. And now they've got cars that not only cruise control, but you flip the switch and you flip the thing twice on the Tesla and guess what happens? <laughs> it self drives. It steers itself. It's automatic. Now you got to keep your hands on it. And I'm not sure I want to give up that much control to any machine. But I like the idea of automatic. Now, Jesus seems to say that God is the automatic gardener. We need to be reminded in this life, it's not all up to you. Your job is to be faithful and to plant the seed. To plant the seed by your example, by the way you live your life in goodness and generosity and love and gratitude, by having compassion and being a merciful person, by being a person who works for justice, by being a person who is a reconciler, practices the discipline of forgiveness. That's your job. Spread that seed. Share the good news in your words with others. Spread it out. But it's not all up to you to bring it to fruition. Not at all. You know, um, it, the other word that I often think about that we live by rather than automatic, I think the other word that we often live by is anticipate. Are you someone who anticipates trouble all the time? We anticipate, oh, what could go wrong? Oh, when's the other shoe going to fall? Uh-oh, I don't know when that's going to happen to my kids. I worry about my kids. I worry about my, you know, some of you have adult kids. You worry about them. You worry about your grandkids. What's going to happen next? What have I got to get prepared for? You've got that, it's almost like, you know, you, you have the guards at the fort, watching the fort at night. You don't know what's coming at you next. And you want to make sure you've got plan A, you've got plan B, you've got plan C, and maybe even plan D. And pretty soon you find yourself living in a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear. It can take over your life. Like kudzu. It can just take over your life. And you have to keep crying to cut it back, but it keeps growing back. And you don't know what to do with it. <laughs> we live in a culture of anxiety. We, this was true before COVID. I mean, can you imagine what COVID did to an already anxious country? We live in fear. Turn on, your, turn on your television. Why do you buy the things you buy? Someone wants to create a need. How do they create a need? Oh, they tell you, you need to be afraid. You got to be afraid. An air purification ad I saw this past week said, are you sure you're breathing clean air? The truth is, most people spend 90% of their time inside where air can be five times more polluted with germs and mold and virus. Do you sure you're breathing clean air? One marketing ad uh, for testosterone drug says, many men 45 years and older just don't feel like they used to. Are you sure you're not one of them? Then there's this ad promising relief from anxiety. Boy, I love ads that promise relief from anxiety. This one's particularly good. If history has taught us anything, it says, it's that we can get through anything and that beer sometimes helps. <laughs> Just in time for Father's Day. Coors Light. Anxiety can be just about anything. That general foreboding about the way the world's going. Boy, we have lived with that, both in 
the virus, but also politics. Whether you're left or right, doesn't make any difference. It's the same experience. You, oh, the world, where is it headed? We don't know. Things are up in the air. A preoccupation. Sometime we can become so preoccupied with our health concerns. I hear this happen. I, I went through this with my parents, too. And I, I, I know when you get older, it's just part of life. But sometimes it's like, is there anything else we can talk about? You know what I mean? It just, every little thing begins as getting more anxious than maybe we really need to be about it. And we start to think about it all the time. I, how about our kids? Because sometimes we're very, very anxious about our kids. Very anxious. How are they going to do in this world? How are they going to make it in the world? They're going to make it? We sure, we look at things, we start thinking, you know, something, done, they're struggling with something. Oh, we jump to conclusions. Oh, no, oh, my goodness, what's going to happen? How, what's, they're not going to make it in this world. Remember all those wealthy people? That wonderful documentary I watched, a horrific thing to see, that where, where that, that person stepped selling, ensuring these ultra-wealthy people that he could make sure they got into whatever college they wanted their child into. Their children were going to make the top tier because he was going to ensure it. Some of those people are in jail now because they listen to a man like that. But they're so anxious about getting ahead. What's going to happen to their kids? And it takes over their sense of morality, their sense of place in this world. It makes them think that they somehow should have it better than everyone else because of just who they are. But we do the same thing. We get afraid about a lot of things. And pretty soon we find ourselves holding our breath and stiffening our muscles, hunching over and staying up all night and waking up and not going back to sleep. Because that anxiety has taken over. Of course, anxiety is a gift of God. It really is. We need our fears. We need that part of ourselves that says, I'm going to look out for the rest of you. I'm going to keep my eye out for things that can go wrong. So, you know, it's a good thing that uh, my sister a while back looked at that little spot on her skin and said, I need to go get to the doctor and check that. And she was able to get it checked and she you know, had the cancer. It was a little cancer early on. She was able to get it taken out. Well, good deal. She did that, right? But it can go too far. Anxiety can really flood your mind and your heart and begin to affect the quality of your relationships because that's all you're thinking about. You're not present to anything else. It can separate you from yourself where you're so preoccupied. It can separate you from God. It can separate from God because at some point, anxiety that's out of control becomes really a lack of faith. Not really trusting that this God who gave us this world is going to care for us and be there with it. This God's going to provide and see us through these times. So there's a real danger we have to overcome. To live alive is to live with that same faith that, you know, I've really been given one job in life, and that's to, that's to share the seed, to, frail, to share the seed of God. It happens with churches, too. I remember back when I was in school at Loyola training to be a psychotherapist, I'd gotten to know the, the district superintendent of the United Methodist Church. I was still a United Methodist pastor. And uh, she said, do you mind if I put you on the preaching list sometime? I said, oh, I'd be glad. Put me on the preaching list. Some churches need, you know, substitute pastor. Well, I got a call. Got a call from a little church down here in Wicker Park. They said, could I come preach their little small congregation for that Sunday? And so I prepared and didn't have a lot of time. I was working four or five jobs. Said, but I, I came up with a sermon, showed up, and you would have thought I was Fred Craddock or Barbara Brown Taylor or... William Sloan Coffin, one of the great preachers that showed up, they thought it was just an amazing sermon. I knew it was not even half of what I should have been able to do that week. And I walked out. Everyone wouldn't let me leave. Everyone wouldn't talk to me. Do I have any family? Am I married? Do I have kids? Do I need a church? Where do I live in the city? And before it's over with, I was convinced that if I joined the church, I could be president next year of the congregation. Such was the anxiety of those people, which is understandable. And you see your church go down and down and down. Like right now, I feel a little anxious. I mean, where is everyone? We've been through COVID. I know people are going to come back more in the fall. But still, you get anxious and you get afraid. And what happens when you get afraid? 
Well, you know, some of the things you fear, you create. That happens with a lot of churches. They get so anxious about their survival, they're doing, they start doing things that run people off. Rather than believing that the church is God's church. It's not our church. That my life, I'm a servant of Christ. I am Christ's son or Christ's daughter. God has purpose for me in the larger scheme of things. And my job is to do what my evangelism professor said. My evangelism professor in theology school was George Morris. George Morris was a Southern guy. He was a great storyteller. I don't remember a lot about his class, but some of the funny stories he shared. But one thing stuck with me that he said over and over to the class. He kept telling us the same thing. It's really quite simple, he said. You have one job and one job only. Your job is to plant the seeds. Your job is then to trust God to do the rest. That none of us convert or bring another person to the faith. We simply share the faith and leave the rest to God. Now that seems to apply to life and my life and your life. To be able to think, I need to be faithful in the things I do. Am I being faithful in speaking the truth? Am I being faithful in living for God's justice and trying to bring reconciliation to this world? Am I being faithful in caring for the environment? Am I being faithful in being a loving, compassionate, merciful, forgiving person? And am I saying the things they bring life to the people I'm closest to and to other people? Or am I tearing it down? And if I'm doing and spreading the seed of God's goodness, my job is not to worry so much, to let go and let God. I love that image, that image the Apostle Paul gives in 2 Corinthians. Oh, 2 Corinthians is a hard book. Paul's not very happy about the Corinthians in that book, at least part of it. He's got it. He's kind of mad at a lot of them, but, but he says some wonderful, beautiful things to that church. He reminds them that we have this spiritual treasure that is in common clay pots. And guess who the clay pots are? We're the clay pots. In order to show that the supreme power belongs not to us, but to God. We're often troubled, but not crushed. Sometimes we're in doubt, but we're never in despair. There are many enemies, but we're never without a friend. And though, the, and though badly hurt at times, we are never, ever destroyed. That's what it means to live in the kingdom, to live with the faith that our job is just to be faithful, not to feel like it's all on us, but to trust. Let us learn to trust that there is a magic garden with God, and God ultimately is the master gardener. We participate, we get to spread the seeds, the seeds of goodness, plant those seeds, Plant them in your children and don't sit and micromanage every single thing and trust that God will take those seeds, even if it doesn't look like it now, will bring life to it. Plant them in the darkest and the hardest places of this world where there's such pain. Plant them and dare to believe God will make those seeds grow and God will bear good fruit in the seeds that you plant. Amen.